Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's DOD Environmental Planning and Conservation Webinar Series presentation. As a reminder, today's presentation will be recorded and then posted on the Natural Resources Adenix website under Resources. Today's presenter is Dr. Thomas Acri, a research ecologist and program scientist at the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. He will be discussing building capacity for managing at-risk species to enable mission readiness on military installations, spotted turtles status assessment and surveys. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions. Before we get started, please take a moment to make sure your phones and computers are on mute. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Tom. Hello, and, and thank you, Jerry, very much for having me here. I'm very excited to talk to you all today about building capacity for managing at-risk species on military installations with a focus on the work that um, my colleagues at the Smithsonian and my colleagues in DOD Park, Chris uh, Peterson and Rob Lovich, and then my colleagues at other NGOs across the country, or excuse me, across the Eastern United States have worked on uh, for the last several years. In particular, uh, my team leader, Jessica Nick. So thank you all for joining me today on this talk about the work we've done over the last several years as part of this larger collaboration for spotted turtles in the Eastern United States and this larger collaboration for uh, spotted turtles and other species through DOD Park on installations in the Eastern United States and across the country. So before I get started, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, you know, many of you may have heard the expression it's turtles all the way down. And for me, it really is turtles all the way down. I've been into turtles since uh, the earliest uh, times that I can remember. I can remember catching my first box turtles and painted turtles. And for those of you that know uh, Chris Peterson and Rob Lovich through your work on installations and with the OD Park and through the legacy program, um, he and I have been friends for a really long time since about the, the time frame in this picture that I'm showing you here where I was with my cousins catching a bullfrog, but right around the same time that I can remember catching turtles for the first time in the single digits. So I've been working on um, conservation ecology for the benefit of reptiles and amphibians, landscapes, biodiversity, um, and people uh, for all of my adult career, which spans about uh, 30 years at this point. <clears throat> Before I get uh, move forward, though, I would like to say thank you very much uh, uh, to Ryan Orndorf and Elizabeth Galley Noble and the whole Legacy Resource Management Program for setting this project up and supporting this project in its entirety over the last couple of years. We were really excited to to develop a cooperative agreement uh, between the Navy and the Smithsonian to do this work after working on um, trying to develop these research proposals with Chris and others. Uh, for the last several years. So thank you all very much. This would not be possible without the support of this program. So the objectives for this talk, um, because I know uh, many of you are biologists and managers interested in its relevance uh, to your installations um, and your cooperation with other researchers and other conservationists and natural resource managers, both on your installation and off, is to give you a background um, on the spotted turtle and its relevance to mission readiness, and then uh, talk to you about the purpose of the cooperative agreement that we set up. Many of you may have already uh, endeavored into these kinds of things with other institutions in, in search of uh, trying to get natural resource management into your NRIPS for uh, at-risk species. Talk about the approach that we uh, worked on across the last couple of years and how it fits into a larger status assessment not a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service status assessment specifically, but a regional status assessment that we were undertaking. And then talk about results and conclusions and follow on actions and next steps, because we believe this is the first step in a series of steps that can benefit um, the spotted turtle and mission readiness on uh, Department of Defense installations. So about the spotted turtle. Well, the spotted turtle, number one, as we think about it, is considered as an endangered species. That is, it's a non-regulatory listed species on the uh, international red list. And that's the group of experts um, in the specialist group who essentially assess that animal biologically. 
It is also considered a species of greatest conservation need in all 21 of the states that it occurs in within the United States. And it's also considered a threatened species of greatest need uh, in adjacent Canada. In addition, most recently over the last couple of years, it has been uh, considered actively as a candidate for listing under the US Endangered Species Act. And so there is a possibility that it could be listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened as early as late 23 or 24. That's not particularly likely in part because of the proactive work that the Department of Defense and the Fish and Wildlife Service and all of the uh, cooperative groups in the Eastern Spotted Turtle Working Group and partners in amphibian and reptile conservation are undertaking. But it is possible and that decision still uh, is in front of us. And that's a separate status assessment than the status assessment that the working group uh, began in 2017. In other words, the one in 2017 was biological as, as part of a group of people who were generally working on the species. And the one that's going to be done in 2023 or 24 is the regulatory one for the Fish and Wildlife Service. So spotted turtles occur all across wetlands in the eastern United States and the Great Lakes Basin, and they're denizens of these shallow wetlands where they spend part of the year in the water and the other part estivating on land. Probably the most interesting thing about spotted turtles is that they respond to explosive pulses of food and water opportunity really quickly. So their activity patterns generally follow rainfall events and the explosion of the food that they eat in response to that and the warming event across the late winter and early spring. And then in the late summer, they are usually on land estivating until the fall rains come again. So for spotted turtle, we had a model framework to develop this Eastern Spotted Turtle Working Group. We had developed one for the Northeast with wood turtle where we first started on the status assessment of the wood turtle and then developed a conservation plan. And in particular in Virginia, we tailored uh, that conservation plan by downscaling the existing plan to, to local and state needs in Virginia. So that gave us a framework for starting this regional status assessment for spotted turtle for the Eastern United States. And like I said, this is the biological status assessment that was not uh, run by the Fish and Wildlife Service, even though it is funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service as part of a competitive state wildlife grant. So we wanted to supplement the Northeast uh, Fish and Wildlife Agency's Regional Conservation Needs Grant. We wanted to understand how to maintain population levels across the Eastern United States and in particular in the Northeast. And in order to do that, we first needed to quantify distributional trends and baselines. We second needed to assess the status at these multiple scales. And then we needed to work on habitat and populations. Essentially, all the things that we did as part of the cooperative agreement with the military in the last couple of years, though downscaled on those DOD sites. Fundamentally, the most important thing that we brought to the table beginning was a rigorous standardized monitoring protocol. Now, there's lots of variations on this theme that can be adapted, but essentially we set up a spatial approach to sampling wetlands in four different uh, centroids on a wetland landscape with five different traps in each of those centroids. Now, again, the number of traps can be adjusted and uh, the number of days can be adjusted for trapping. But our baseline was five traps where we set up rapid assessments and demographic assessments. And I'll tell you later more about how we adapted them. So we did that spatial uh, configuration based on our experience. We, 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 we devised a method for setting out traps, and then we came up with standardized forms for collecting those data on spotted turtles as we captured them and we took their demographic information. So one of the first things that we did that set up the opportunity for this project was to actually do some region-wide monitoring for <coughs> Virginia in particular and for North Carolina. In Virginia, we actually worked in advance on several Department of Defense sites, that is um, Army and Navy installations and, and Marine uh, bases in Virginia in 2018 and 2019 as part of these early CSWIG efforts. So we looked at 15 sites overall. We had 22 
160 trap nights, we got 333 captures of turtles, and we postponed our efforts for 2020 uh, in general just because of, uh, of, of, of COVID. In North Carolina, we had to delay by a year, but in 2020 and 2021, we uh, worked through an interagency agreement in support of CSWIG to look at five different sites on refuges, forest service lands, and wildlife resource commission lands. We put out six, we had 680 trap nights. We got 138 trap captures and 30 hand captures in those setups. Those basically formed the foundation for at least this part of the team to work on some components of this DOD work. In addition, we were also developing in the background two complementary models for understanding where we could find spotted turtles on the landscape. Number one, we looked at a species distribution model to predict relative probability of occurrence using kind of standard natural features at multiple scales. Number two, we collaborated with the University of Massachusetts Landscape Ecology Lab, who were working pro to, to proactively design sustainable landscapes through uh, habitat configuration uh, assessments, not necessarily where the animals were found. So in other words, they were looking at the habitat that animals could be found in by looking at habitat capability, climate niche, and a prevalence index that they built for the Northeast. Overall, in those what now is, you know, come up to be about uh, five years, we developed a status assessment led by our colleagues up in the Northeast, but in large measure supported by us and collaboratively worked on uh, through our Department of Defense work. <clears throat> and that was published this fall um, uh, by Liz Wiley and others and is available at northeastturtles.org. I'll give you that contact again later. Now, many of you know this uh, working for the Department of Defense, but it's it is it is beyond coincidence that we're talking about spotted turtles in this context, because in general, Department of Defense lands are incredibly important for conservation, specifically for at risk, threatened and endangered species and ecosystems. We know that, for example, um, the percentage of species on DOD lands is only eclipsed in the eastern United States and in general for t and &E and uh, imperiled species by the Forest Service. And in fact, the Department of Defense has a much higher proportion of t and &E and imperiled species uh, per its coverage, considering it has so many fewer acres of coverage compared to the forest, the BLM, and even uh, Fish and Wildlife Service refuges. <clears throat> and that's primarily uh, because of where Department of Defense lands are. Historically, uh, highly concentrated on our coasts um, in California, where there's a big concentration of endangered species, and in the southeastern United States, where there's a big concentration of endangered species and priority ecosystems for those species. And obviously, you know, we see that in this map number three here from the Atlantic data from the Department of Defense. Um, <clears throat> The other part of this equation is that this kind of required the need for the development of Chris Peterson and Rob Lovich and everyone else's Department of Defense partners in amphibian and reptile conservation, which has been working to develop this capacity for spotted turtles and lots of other species across the United States and in particular in the Southeast. So as part of their work, they assessed the, the distribution of amphibians and reptiles on DOD installations, and they found in 2018 that at least 39 installations, now it's about 41, of all branches or divisions of the DOD had spotted turtles known to occur on them, and at least uh, a, about 60 more installations potentially had them occurring. That's obviously changed a little bit in the last couple years. So with that in mind, and the work we were doing in the background as part of this Eastern Spotted Turtle Working Group and our work with um, uh, DOD Park, we put together this cooperative agreement through the Chesapeake Watershed CESU with the objectives to improve the understanding of the abundance and distribution on installations, create a replicable model for conservation uh, approaches on military installations with, within installations where there were confirmed observations and those with potential habitat, and then generally raise awareness for this specific scientific approach and the overall conservation and management objectives in order to integrate the management opportunities, so those best management plans, 
into NRIPS. So we started working on these nine installations from Massachusetts to Georgia. And we did this because as a result of the conservate of the competitive state wildlife grant and the Eastern Spotted Turtle Working Group and our work with DOD Park, we had relationships through Park, good ones with the American Turtle Observatory, the Orion Society, and the Mid-Atlantic Center for Herpetology and Conservation. And each of those groups had relationships with existing installations. So we were able to put together an assembly of installations that represented a model for undertaking this approach through them and through the support of the state agency biologists and agencies in general that enabled us to do this work. So overall, we worked at Camp Curtis Guild in Massachusetts, Camp Edwards in Massachusetts, Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst in uh, New Jersey, Fort Belvoir in Virginia, Marine Corps Base Quantico in Virginia, AP Hill in Virginia, uh, Northwest Annex in Virginia, and Fort Stewart in Georgia. And then, like I said, in all cases, we were representing each of the uh, divisions or branches of the military. We worked across six different eco uh, regions in five different states. And in all cases, we were working with biologists and leadership at the uh, Department of Defense sites or installations with um, collaborative partners as part of the NGOs or the Smithsonian in order to get this work done. So overall, our team was, was, was involved 37 personnel, including leadership at Legacy and, and leadership at DOD Park, leadership at the installations and all of the managers and biologists at, at those installations and all the folks in the Smithsonian and in the NGOs. So these were 12 different inst inst institutions among six different branches of the, of the Department of Defense at nine installations in five states with nine different roles in support of about of the cooperative agreement among about 18 different positions across those different uh, organizations. <clears throat> and we set up across the fall of 2020 and into the spring of 2021, the opportunity to begin doing surveillance work at those sites through those DOD personnel and those partner personnel and began working, as I said earlier, as early as February 2018 and March 2019, um, in, in where we did advance work. But um, overall, we began in earnest in early March of 2021 to do all this work and get out in the field and begin to survey all those sites by working with the biologists through their GIS infrastructure, through their records databases, understanding where those animals were on site, how to get access to those sites where they were and continue to work across the season in order to use the trapping and, and visual encounter survey protocols to find turtles and then adapt those in order to find even more turtles where the installation managers were interested. So on Camp Curtis Guild and Camp Edwards in Massachusetts, we worked in both flooded forest ecosystems and emergent uh, shrub marsh and um, and uh, vegetated marsh systems uh, in northern uh, Massachusetts and on Cape Cod. At Joint Bakes, McGuire Dix Lakehurst and at Fort Belvoir, we worked at both um, uh, flooded shadow, shallow wetlands in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey and uh, um, swamp systems and uh, flooded forests um, in northeastern uh, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. on the Potomac. At Marine Corps Base Quantico, uh, and Fort AP Hill, uh, we worked in a series of different kinds of systems, so emergent swamps, shrub swamps, um, flooded forests, beaver uh, impoundments, et cetera. At uh, Nasana in uh, southeastern Virginia and at Fort Stewart, we worked mostly in uh, flooded forests and ecotones along flooded forests in Virginia and Georgia. And so we, we through the surveillance process, we then, you know, obviously worked to figure out where we would undertake the visual encounter surveys and the trapping surveys in order to detect spotted turtles. 
which in most cases, most of the installations knew well about in general, in terms of their general presence on site. As I said, they had been uh, confirmed there, but they didn't know necessarily how to predictably find them or under what circumstances they could do that. So I said, we put up these standardized scrapping and visual encounter survey protocols um, and conducted trap rapid assessments, which were five traps in uh, four different centroids for three trap nights, demographic assessments, uh, which would be the same kind of configuration over a longer term in order to be able to get some sense of the demographic structure of the population or component of the population there. And then inventory trapping, which was some variation on in, uh, what the installation managers wanted us to do uh, with limited resources in terms of setting traps out outside of that configuration in order to detect them. We use Promar traps in the Northeast and we use crab traps, modified crab traps in the Southeast in order to catch these turtles. In both cases, they were typically baited with sardines or cat food and sometimes very occasionally even with um, decoys. We set these traps in shallow water where the majority of the trap uh, could be seen from above the water and had a float in it along with a bait capsule was staked down so it wouldn't be moved by predators very far if at all. We actually galvanized the out exterior of these traps with chicken wire if predators did actually interfere with the trapping opportunity in order to protect the turtles and protect the trapping opportunity. So uh, uh, along those sites, I want to show you more or less uh, what some of those configurations look like. And so first I'm gonna show you um, what some of the configurations look like at Camp Edwards in Massachusetts. Then I'll show you some configurations. These are spatial configurations of how we set up this work at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst in New Jersey. Next, I'll show you uh, some work at Marine Corps Base Quantico in Virginia, and then AP Hill in Virginia as well, and Nasana or Naval Support Activities Northwest Annex in Virginia, and then finally at Fort Stewart in Georgia. So here's a configuration or a GIS uh, uh, map of both our trap rapid assessments and our demographic assessments at Camp Edwards on Cape Cod, showing you where we set out the uh, trap rapid assessments in the cluster over to the left center uh, side of the, of, the, of the installation and the demographic assessments up to the north of the installation. And then uh, up close on the right are the um, up close uh, views of the demographic assessments where we trapped over the course of several weeks in order to actually, as I said, get a picture of the demographic structure of the population. And here, of course, is an up close of the actual trap rapid assessment where we just conducted with four times five, that is four uh, centroids with five traps each times three trap nights uh, in order to, to detect presence uh, in a given area. Here is Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst again on the left, showing you the reference plots for the trap rapid assessments and the demographic assessments, and on the right, showing you the up close. Um, distribution of the trap rapid assessments and the demographic assessments showing you where we trapped. And then the additional yellow uh, dots are inventory traps that were inventory trapping that were set up across the installation and in response to areas where we had encountered spotted turtles or installation personnel had counted spotted turtles through visual encounter surveys, through incidental encounters on site, and through additional work in the past. So we set up those inventory traps as well. Uh, here is Marine uh, Corps Base Quantico uh, showing you on the left, the uh, upper or Western and lower or Eastern portion of the installation with uh, both uh, uh, demographic assessments and rapid assessments in the East and inventory trapping in the West. So if we uh, zoom in on the um, right, we see the configuration of inventory trapping across the western part of the installation. This again was in response to uh, desire by management personnel to understand and us to understand more about the distribution overall of spotted turtles on the site. This here is um, an, an, a set of images for Fort APL showing you on the left the distribution of the reference plots um, in the northeast of Fort APL and on the right the distribution up close of those sites 
showing you that in 2021, we actually only had one uh, trap location where we're able to capture turtles at Fort APL. Fort APL is interesting in the sense that we know there are lots of locations across the installation where there are turtles, but in 2021, for example, with the drought, we were, we were not particularly successful in detecting them despite quite a lot of effort. So if we go back to 2019 and we see that there was uh, a few other locations where we effectively trapped turtles, but we're unable to do that again in 2021. So Fort APL is, in the, is like many of these sites an, an example of a place where a lot more work is needed for us to really understand the abundance of turtles across the installation in a way that would enable us to, to develop best management practices that are meaningful to mission readiness and the spotted turtle. So here again are all of the different uh, inventory sites across the installation where we set up to try to find spotted turtles across the installation. At uh, um, Naval Support Activities uh, Northwest Annex, showing you where we trapped in uh, both 20 or in 2021 as part of our reference plots, and then here on the right in 2019, uh, showing you where we trapped. So a lot of work at this site and some really interesting results as well that I'll show you in a second. And then Fort Stewart, the last of the, the uh, GIS imagery and distribution shots to show you how we set this up. The interesting cases at Fort Stewart, which I'll show you in a second, is despite the fact that, that our, our colleagues, our partners at the Orion Society and natural resource managers at Fort Stewart were aware that there were spotted turtles across the site. In fact, recent records were the guider for where they put all of these uh, traps and conducted their um, visual encounter service, they were unable to detect spotted turtles in 2021, despite this incredible amount of work across a very large site. Again, pointing to the to how cryptic these animals are and how difficult they can be to detect under certain conditions like drought. So here's an example of the results of successful trapping, um, showing uh, our uh, technician, Emily Sikora and Taylor Austin, uh, with a trap that has uh, spotted turtles in it and the response of pulling some turtles from traps. And so this is kind of like a happy day when you're trying to figure out where these animals are found across installations. This is an up close uh, photograph of both a female on the left and a male on the right. The female has kind of a domed carapace. Um, you know, you would need to see that a little bit better up against what a male's is, but males are typically more flat. And then the diagnostic for a male in general is this concave plastron, the bottom of the shell with an enlarged tail and the cloaca on that tail being more or less posterior to the back of the shell. We also in several cases detected juveniles, particularly at places like Camp Edwards where we got a lot of turtles. So here's an up close um, image of a, of a juvenile spotted turtle showing you with our, our data sheets. Overall, we trapped for two, 2,085 trap nights with um, about 117 visual encounter surveys in hours. Um, we, we, we made 213 total captures, so not a ton, but most of them were individuals, so 179 total individuals. Again, overall 2,085 total trap nights, 213 captures, and 179 total individuals. If we look more closely we, in, at our lowest effort, Fort Belvoir, our effort at Fort Belvoir was low primarily because of drought uh, really restricted our ability to survey there. So 23 total trap nights. We actually got 11 captures in those 23 trap nights. And so that's our highest catch per unit effort at 0.478. If we look at Fort Stewart, an incredibly high number of trap nights, 630, but no total turtles despite all that effort. And again, that's the mystery for us, which I don't think we can necessarily predictably get around, though we are working on trying to figure out alternative trap methods for the Southeast. So I'll report back to you as I know more. Northwest Annex, which is again, uh, one of our uh, fairly successful sites with uh, just uh, slightly more than Fort Belvoir at 80 trap nights. We actually got 26 captures, uh, whoops, wrong way. Um, at Fort AP Hill with 130 trap nights, again, only two trap captures in 2021, which is why we included 2019 in some of our estimates. 
again, primarily because of drought and the difficulty with knowing where those turtles are across the installation. And then joint base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, a lot of trap nights, 300, but uh, 44 total captures in, among uh, with 43 individuals. And then Camp Edwards, the overall leader with quite a lot of trap nights, 316, but half the total amount at Fort Stewart and 50 captures with 32 individuals. If we look at this summary table for demographics, we see that, you know, comparing males to females and captures to individuals, in all cases for females, we're more or less getting more captures and fewer individuals. So we are getting some recaptures across our sampling period in more or less all of the cases. This is more or less the same with males and more or less the same with juveniles, but less so with juveniles. We tend to get as almost as many uh, individuals as we did captures. So um, juveniles are not moving around as much. We're not detecting them as readily. Um, they may not come to traps in part because of their response to adults, but in general for males and females, we are getting um, some animals that will return to traps. We also got bycatch of species of greatest conservation need and at-risk species across all of this effort where we captured about 90 individuals of 37 uh, total taxa, including, as I said, SGCN uh, and at-risk species of insect, arthropod and mollusk invertebrates, fishes and amphibians and reptiles. And as you would imagine, we've got um, higher, very high abundances of very few species in the Northeast and uh, moderate abundances of a lot of different species in the Southeast. So overall, um, you know, uh, if we look at our catch per unit effort and our individuals, we're able to generate abundance estimates using an end mixture approach to estimating abundance from our trap data. And we see again, if we look at our lowest level of um, of effort because of drought at Fort Belvoir, that um, our abundance estimate at Fort Belvoir drawn from 11 captures uh, and 10 individuals is about 20 total individuals. Now that would obviously change dramatically with a lot more trapping, but we were limited in time and space at that time in 2021. If we jump down to Fort Stewart, obviously we're not gonna have an abundance estimate since we didn't catch any turtles. If we jump up to Fort AP Hill again in the same succession that we had before, we um, see that we got uh, an estimate of about eight total turtles, which again is not particularly impressive um, and requires, I think, some more investigation at AP Hill. At Northwest Annex, uh, in, in 200 trap nights, we actually do have a fairly robust population size for the, for the limited amount of trapping that we did overall in that season, 76.3 total turtles. And then at Camp Edwards, we have a very large uh, and fairly open population with an estimate of about 156.9 turtles. With an overall uh, number of individuals, as I said, in this particular uh, evaluation of 143, because in this case at AP Hill and at Nasana, we actually included data from 18 or excuse me, 19 in order to be able to generate those abundance estimates. So overall, Camp Edwards has far and away the highest abundance estimate, somewhere between 100 and 200, as we said, about 156. And, and it also suggests with those really large error bars, if we're looking at A in the left down to the lower portion of the figure, that um, the population is quite open. And that suggests that we're catching a lot of individuals and not a lot of recaptures at Camp Edwards. And so we might have uh, a, a very large and robust population at Camp Edwards. Among the rest, if we look over at B, we see that uh, Nasana has the largest overall population estimate with a fairly large uh, uh, error estimate, but Marine uh, Corps Base Quantico actually has a much bigger uh, standard error, probably in part because as a result of sampling all over the installation, we're capturing individuals that we're probably not likely to recapture as much as we did at Nasana. And then we move kind of down the, the, the scale with Fort Bell, War Fort APL, and Camp uh, Curtis Guild having fewer and smaller estimates. When we look at the features or the factors that actually influence uh, what we are uh, getting, um, we see that 
and this is totally intuitive and not surprising. I just wanted to look at this and demonstrate how these factors actually influence the data that folks are reading in this report and therefore how we integrate thinking about this into best management practices and developing approaches for continuing this work, both on the existing installations and on new installations. We see that, you know, right off the bat, that the number of trap nights across all of the sites minus uh, Fort Stewart, uh, the number of trap nights influences trap captures. That's not at all surprising, right? The more effort you put in, the more you're gonna get. Not at all surprising. We saw that in our, 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 our evaluations earlier. That of course is not again surprising to be the same for individuals because like we said, in most cases, we were not recapturing a lot of individuals across uh, the diff the, across the installations uh, within 2021. That could change with additional work. For males and females, there's not a big difference between the two, but again, we were seeing that both males and female captures go up with the number of total trap nights. And these trap nights, uh, the, the all designation versus the SA designation includes, excuse me, inventory trapping in the sense that uh, standardized assessment trapping just was limited to the array trapping that was part of the um, centroid or arrays where we trap together. So all trap nights includes uh, the inventory trapping as well. When we go further and, um, well, excuse me, before we do that, let's look down below male captures at juvenile captures. We actually don't see a real response um, in the line below male captures with juvenile captures in terms of the slope that is at 0 0.015 or the p-value for the equation or the coefficient of determination. None of those indicate that juvenile captures really went up with increased trap nights. Um, when we look at adult juvenile ratio, not surprisingly, um, it didn't really change over time. We thought that maybe over time, uh, juveniles would increase in the proportion of the sample with trapping effort. But in case, in, like I said, because juvenile captures doesn't really go up, we're not actually capturing a larger proportion of juveniles over time. So that ratio doesn't really go down. If we look at abundance and um, the standard error of the abundance estimate, we see that um, abundance uh, doesn't uh, really go up with trap nights. In other words, our estimate of abundance doesn't really go up with trap nights. And that's primarily driven from the fact that um, across all of these installations, we have highly varying abundance estimates for these different sites and fairly different um, trap night efforts at some of these different sites. So that in order to get a strong response, we just need more to do more work either within a site or across sites. Now, what's interesting um, in terms of the standard error to the abundance ratio, I thought that maybe with more data that the error bars would go down as we recaptured more individuals. But uh, in fact, we're not seeing that that really did go down. I mean, the slope is slightly negative, but there's no indication that that's a really strong relationship. So we're at the very beginning of understanding where spotted turtles are in general at these installations is my point. But there is real conservation application, right? This work that we've done is meaningful in terms of a baseline or a foundation for science informing conservation management and practice. And it's, an, and it's definitely a replicable model for thinking about ways to build capacity in terms of training folks on installations, training folks in supportive installations to work with these standard protocols and understand these basic ways of assessing the distribution and status and health of spotted turtle populations on these sites so that they can end up being managed uh, in the NRIPS to support mission readiness. So we see it as a way of promoting cooperation and partnerships that can help uh, both these uh, support organizations like the Smithsonian and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the overall organization, the Department of Defense, in dealing with this. It allows us to prioritize conservation actions and resources uh, where we can get a strong signal on how to do that, uh, let's say at places like Camp Edwards. Um, and it also identifies where we need to work more on baseline uh, data, let's say at Fort Stewart or at Fort AP Hill, but maybe not necessarily at Fort Belvoir, where even though we didn't do a lot of work, 
One of our colleagues has recently been working there and has quite a lot of baseline information for spotted turtles. So overall, you know, this kind of information feeds directly into, you know, the best management practices and the integrated natural resource management plans um, for the different installations, both those where we've done the work and, you know, as we move forward on those 58 or so installations where they're suspected to be there, um, uh, you can still work with best management practices and refine them based on work that we or others might do to help inform on the presence and abundance and status of those populations. These uh, uh, best management practices are available on the DOD Park uh, website, and I've included each of them um, into the, the uh, resource um, uh, product or the uh, report that we did for this work, and we've tailored them in a general sense to the regions. So the Massachusetts region, the Northern Mid-Atlantic region, the Virginia region, and the Georgia region, and we would like to, you know, move further down this list of 16 or so BMPs, which are focused on species management and habitat management and predator management and wetland management um, in order to be able to kind of inform uh, natural resource managers and biologists how to think about where spotted turtles are on their installation. So that takes these general categories and kind of works with folks on the ground for that kind of tailoring. Our next steps um, for this kind of work, uh, we're excited to, uh, you know, let you know that um, as a result of this work, um, Legacy, uh, the, the Legacy program uh, has supported the development uh, with Smithsonian, um, uh, a, a Western pond turtle um, approach on West Coast installations. So we're going to replicate this cooperative agreement to understand the distribution, abundance and health of western pond turtles on uh, west coast installations mostly in california at this time and that's primarily because you know we 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 came to understand and clarified through our work with the spotted turtle that the department of defense uh, necessarily uh, without without debate has geographically and demographically important populations in the eastern seaboard we also, you know, from a science perspective, um, think that we have enough information to start thinking about management, particularly about uh, best management practices on these installations where we did this work. But more work is needed to kind of expand in some cases within these installations and refine in other cases on those lands. And specifically, you know, we, we see that there's probably a need for more work where people are interested on uh, installations with known populations and also where we think the suitable habitat is really kind of ripe for consideration on those installations where we don't yet know but suspect that populations occur. A uh, one important takeaway is that uh, our visitation of these sites and our general landscape level thinking about spotted turtles leads us to believe that Although, you know, we've established that the Department of Defense is incredibly important and responsible for these uh, natural resources, both in terms of a biological perspective and in terms of a regulatory perspective, and ultimately as it relates to managing mission readiness, we think that, um, that the, the way in which these animals move across the wetscape or the landscape in these sites may make it such that working alone, that is, you know, within an installation, inward looking, may not be effective. I'm not saying it's not effective, but it may need to be complemented and enhanced by partnerships uh, for land adjacencies and other kinds of um, public private partnerships. We definitely thought that the cooperative agreement has been very productive, and that's why we're very excited to start again uh, with the Western Pond Turtle. And we look forward very much to talking to you all where it's relevant to you all to continue with this work with Spotted Turtle on the, inst the nine where we've worked and on in other installations where you all think it might be important. To that end, we have also engaged in developing a uh, CERTIP uh, pre-proposal for Spotted Turtles and a CERTIP proposal for Western Pond Turtles. I'm the lead on the uh, uh, proposal for Spotted Turtle. In that case, we are working with the CERTIP program to look at a multi-stressor cumulative risk assessment for spotted turtle. 
that's just a fancy kind of science jargony way of saying that we're trying to determine whether or not landscape vegetative management, fire, drought, sea level rise, and other potential stressors to populations of spotted turtles can interact in a way that has beyond just an additive effect, but also kind of a synergistic effect where the overall effect is disproportionately large. And so we want to see if spotted turtles, for example, are at, are at real risk for those major stressors on DOD installations and on uh, sites in the same geography where uh, management off-site or on-site can be particularly useful to um, managing mission readiness and these at-risk species. With that, I would like to you know, acknowledge all of the folks, and this is not even beginning to be a completely exhaustive list. There are many folks that I didn't mean to forget, but unfortunately have. So if you don't see your name on here and you know you were part of this, thank you very much. We absolutely are incredibly grateful, like I said earlier, to leadership at Legacy, to leadership at DOD Park, to all of our colleagues in the various organizations that supported this. So the Orion Society, the Mid-Atlantic uh, um, um, Association for Herpetology and Conservation, the American Turtle Observatory, and all of the leadership at the installations and the biologists and managers and support technicians at those installations. We could not do this without you. We don't want to do it without you. We're very excited about this kind of cooperative approach to managing these species, and we look forward to continuing to do this with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have a question already. Um, has eDNA trapping been employed in low detection locations? Um, I'm going to unshare and come on video, and that's a great question. So I think you all can see me right now. Uh, I hope you can. Um, and the answer to that question is yes, it has, and it has been successfully deployed by my colleagues on Department of Defense installations through uh, an Army Corps of Engineer lab um, run by Janelle Sperry. So my lab uh, collaborates with um, our folks at the Center for Conservation Genomics downtown, and we've been working on department, or excuse me, we've been working on eDNA assays for wood turtles, and more recently for spotted turtles, and in the same time that we've been doing the kind of advanced work on uh, wood turtles and the kind of uh, beginning or piloting work on spotted turtles, some folks working with Dr. Sperry and her team have had success um, working on Aberdeen Proving Ground and other sites like that with eDNA. We're going to collaborate uh, either indirectly or directly with them in order to uh, continue to do this work on um, sites across the Northeast and the Southeast. So we're starting, for example, in Vermont and we'll continue working um, in the Southeast should we get a Fish and Wildlife Service grant to do that. But for us, we fundamentally believe that environmental DNA is an essential part moving forward to kind of a hierarchical approach of, of looking for spotted turtles. So we could imagine, you know, instead of trying to bomb a landscape with, um, I mean, that's metaphor, bomb a landscape with traps for spotted turtles, we can essentially bomb a landscape with eDNA tests for, spot, for spotted turtles. And then where we get hits at a much lower personnel and money cost, we can then decide to trap and understand the incidence of occupancy and abundance. We have a question from Paul. Any projects in the making for surveying eastern box turtles? That's a great question. Um, and that is that's not something that is up to me right now. There's a much larger group that I'm not in central leadership for 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 box turtles. But um, there is no question that in the eastern United States, as it relates to the state agencies, as it relates to the federal agencies, as it relates to the academics, um, and other scientists who are interested in conservation of these um, at-risk turtle species, that box turtle is becoming increasingly uh, important uh, 
in in terms of the rate at which it looks like it's being poached and the rate at which we're losing um, distribution through range contraction uh, on landscapes that have been changed. So the shorter answer is for Department of Defense installations, I don't know, though I have some sense that there may be some interaction with uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts state governments and agencies for that. Right now, um, I'm not seeing a lot, but that doesn't mean that at the state level, there aren't a lot of one-offs where folks are working on stuff and I am working on stuff in Virginia. So the opportunity is there. We, we will probably move next into a kind of regional collaborative that can help provide capacity for that with the Department of Defense. Uh, next question is, do you collect any tissue or blood samples during your survey? The answer is yes. One, there, there are multiple reasons why we want to collect blood, uh, t blood samples from our, from our turtles, from the turtles um, at Department of Defense installations and beyond. The first reason is so that we can have some general understanding of the structuring um, or the evolutionary relationships or the phylogeographic, biogeographic relationships among these populations. So, for example, understanding where these populations are very finely structured or where they are admixed or where they are very different or where they're very similar across the range is very important in terms of thinking about how to prioritize certain population segments and therefore certain landscapes for those populations, whether that be for habitat conservation through the Department of Defense, through the Fish and Wildlife Service, through state agencies, through law enforcement and protection from poaching. The other piece is to where possible, and, and, and in many cases people are working on this, be able to actually refine down to the level of understanding where an animal came from on, let's say, a landscape level, let's say within a hundred mile radius, that's ballpark. But the point there is that these um, turtles like spotted turtles and box turtles, it appears are being poached off of landscapes at a rate that's high enough that we actually have to think seriously about trying to repatriate them should there be any kind of interdiction or confiscation. Mm -hmm. And so knowing their provenance is very important. Uh, kind of piggybacking off the habitat, have there been consistent ob observations? Uh, obs uh, have there been any consistently observed habitat preferences across the the range or regionally? Any information about anthropogenic habitats? Did I say that right? I think so. the The last part is a little bit vague to me, but I'll give it a shot. So. Yes, I did not spend a lot of time on habitats um, and the summary statement for habitats is um, ephemeral and shallow wetlands. And so ephemerals are just vernal pools or seasonally flooded forests or seasonally flooding and draining marshes or uh, meadows or shrub swamps. The, the key feature of spotted turtle wetlands is that they are shallow and they change. So in the spring and winter, they're often full of water. In the summer, they're often very low or without water. And in the fall, under normal years, they often fill up. Um, so that is, that's, those are the essential components of spotted turtle habitat. That takes lots of different shapes, right, depending on where you are in the US and Canada. As it relates to anthrop anthropogenic habitat creation, I would think the answer is that, you know, where wetland creation is an important mitigation and restoration process on DOD lands, on refuges, on other public properties. Uh, anthropogenic habitat um, mitigation, uh, restoration, or complement um, enhancement uh, can be can be definitely value added. Uh, 
OK, I have a question for you, Tom, and I think we'll make this the last one. Going back to your trappings and the fact that you didn't get any spotted turtles at the one installation, it escapes my mind off the minute. Fort um, Stewart. Fort Stewart. When you were out there or when your team was out there, did they spot any of the turtles while they were out there putting the traps in? Or is it kind of hard to spot them while they're doing like a uh, like a general survey of the area to try and decide where to put the traps in. I find it interesting that you guys didn't catch any at all. Yeah, that is a great question. And it's a great ending question. So I'll take I'll take the next three minutes to answer it. So first of all, spotted turtles are generally hard to find across the year. So there are very narrow windows under which that they can be seen, visually seen. And that is typically late winter and early spring when they bask. And other than that, it's a real challenge to actually see them. If you were to spend lots of hours in a, in a swamp, you might encounter one occasionally. If it was a really robust population and you were right on top of it under the right conditions, you might encounter uh, a few. So this works great in the Northeast where it's cold. You can go out there in the late winter and early spring and those spotted turtles are gonna be basking their butts off in order to get warm enough to eat. And then once they've eaten in order to get warm enough to digest their food. But as you move South, especially by the time you get South of let's say Southern North Carolina, spotted turtles just don't need to bask as much anymore. So detecting them visually becomes increasingly difficult and even impossible, let's say, in Georgia, in places in Georgia and Florida, where they don't bask at all. That's one part answer to your question. The other part is that on the surface, when you have a team of so-called so experts who go out there and they're using recent records to find uh, places where to trap and they can't trap turtles, it seems like, are they really experts? Does this method really work? Well, the answer is under the best of conditions. So if you trap early when the turtles are hungry and when they're kind of clustered around the wintertime hibernacula sites, trapping can be incredibly effective. Uh, effective. And that, you know, obviously that goes later into the season as you're further north. So you can trap later as you, as you trap further north. But in the southeast, like in Georgia, when and where they are in hibernacula, when and where they're hungry, and when and where they're distributed across these across. giant wetland systems, which is a very important difference between, let's say, the Northeast and the Southeast. As you move south into from Virginia into North Carolina, and certainly across South Carolina and Georgia, the general coastal plain wetland systems become bigger and bigger and bigger overall. And as a result, those turtles can be anywhere. I mean, not literally, but they're spread all over the landscape from one day to the next as they move in response to rainfall events and you know, hatching events for the food they eat. So it just means that the challenge for finding how to find them in the Southeast is generally much harder than it is in the Northeast. And that's actually what we're working on next. Thank you so much. And it was a very informative um, talk. And thank you so much for um, coming on and doing this for us. I greatly, we greatly appreciate it. Hey, hey Jerry. Yes. This is Rob. I just wanted to say one thing real quick. Uh, yes. Tom, you, and hey, old friend, you did a great job, buddy. Uh, in regard to Paul's question about the box turtle, I just wanted to add a layer, and uh, you responded great, Tom, but that the funding for such species and such projects was derived from our mission sensitive species list. And that was something that Chris and I worked with the military services and DOD to determine what species are not federally protected currently that might be next up. And the spotted turtle made the cut, but the box turtle did not. However, if folks are really interested in something and we might be missing something, by all means, bring it up with Chris and I, and we can take a look at that. But there is that added layer to uh, what, you know, we don't have infinite amounts of money and, and uh, 
and staff and, and folks who can work on any species. And so um, that's another reason why the box turtle isn't getting a, a great deal of attention within DOD at the present. Just wanted to add that. That's a good point to add. Thank you, Rob. And, and with that, um, we'll end today's DOD webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you again, Tom, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you and thank you all. Everybody have a good day. Bye. Thank you.